So let's continue our discussion about the Pontryagin maximum principle that we had started discussing in the next in the previous class. Let me just write minimum principle because we are minimum principle. And that's because we are doing cost minimization. And we have the following problem. I have xt plus one equals to ft xt ut x naught is given. The initial state is given. And my cost function j is a function of open loop control, which consists of a running cost and a terminal cost that depends only on the terminal state. Okay, and in the previous class, we had learned about what is the, uh, uh, so in the last, in the previous class, we learned about the gradient of J with respect to UT, what exactly that gradient is equal to. So in order to write that gradient in a simplified fashion, let me introduce a new notation, which is called Hamiltonian. which is defined as H as a function of XT, UT and PT plus one. So it's important. This is the co-state vector at the next time, step, uh, next time step and the current state action pair. And this is given by This is the definition of a Hamiltonian. Okay, this particular uh, function of the current state action pair and the next uh, time steps co-state vector, this term is known as Hamiltonian of the system. And it comprises of the state transition function at time t, the co-state vector at the next time t, and the current cost function, the current cost function or the running cost of the current time. And the, what the maximum principle says is as follows or rather the minimum principle, what it says is as follows. Let me write down the year. It's around 1948. I don't know what is the exact, I don't remember the year right now. So it says the following, let u0 star to ut minus one star be optimal. open loop control action with initial state X naught. Let X one star to X T star be the corresponding optimal trajectory. Then there exist the one star to 
pt star such that let me again remind you these are called co-state vectors So I have a sequence of optimal control actions, uh, open loop control actions. So they don't depend on the current state. They, the actions depend only on the initial state. So you have a sequence of optimal control action. Uh, we define the optimal trajectory um, using x1 star to xt star. Then there exist co-state vectors such that number one, gradient ui of sorry, ut of ht, xt star, ut star, pt plus one star equals to zero. This is also equal to the derivative of the overall cost function j with respect to ut. Okay, so given the optimal open loop control action and the corresponding optimal trajectory, I can find co-state vectors such that the gradient of the Hamiltonian vanishes along the optimal trajectory and the co-state vectors are updated in this backward fashion. So you start with the terminal, the co-state vector at the terminal time, and then you define the co-state vector at time t. So this is the backward propagation part. And it turns out that if U is not in RM, like the set of control actions is not the entire Euclidean space, then you can write UT star as argument of the Hamiltonian itself. So UT star basically minimizes the Hamiltonian along the optimal trajectory. Okay, and this is the part for which we haven't done the proof, but this is the actual statement of the max minimum principle. So. Of course, if uh, ut is a minimum of Hamiltonian, then the first derivative of u of the Hamiltonian will vanish, will be equal to zero along the optimal trajectory. But the more general theorem statement says that ut star actually minimizes the Hamiltonian along the optimal trajectory. So this is the general statement. Uh, this is something we have proved in the last class on Monday. Uh, but this is the one prime is the general statement about how 
the optimal action is computed in case uh, your uh, set of control action is not the entire Euclidean space. Okay, so this is the famous Hamiltonian principle. One of the things, uh, sorry, um, uh, minimum principle. One of the things that I've asked you to do in the current assignment, which is assignment six, which is due next Wednesday, what I've asked you to do is to derive the backpropagation algorithm for training neural network using basically the, these two equations. Okay, so in, in when you are training neural network, your UT is actually the weight. Your FT is essentially the uh, how, how the uh, output of the perceptron changes based on the weight and the output of the previous layer. And then you have only a terminal cost, which is the training error. And, uh, and you can use this theorem to compute the, uh, the backpropagation, to derive the backpropagation algorithm for training neural networks. Now, I know that not all of you are working on neural networks, but because this algorithm is extremely important in machine learning and uh, uh, some of the emerging areas of reinforcement learning, I think it's a good um, exercise to do this, to apply this minimum principle to derive the backpropagation algorithm. Are there any questions on this theorem? Okay, once again, I want to remind you that this is exactly how a lot of engineering systems work, whether it's chemical plant. So if you if you have to introduce optimization in a chemical plant or in a car engine or a truck engine or, or some other generator and so on, all of which are dynamic systems, all of which have an underlying state and the state transition function for those systems are very well known because they have been around for hundreds of years. And the physics, physical modeling of those systems have already been done over the past uh, several decades. So you know what the uh, state transition function is, you know what the states of that system are, uh, you know what the actions on that systems are, you know what the running cost and the terminal cost for those systems are. Again, all of which have been derived over the period of several decades. So it's not like uh, you enter the industry and you come up with some cost function, it's actually already there and people who are um, who have been in that industry for a long time know exactly what cost function to pick and all that. Um, so you enter the industry and your supervisor will tell you, here is the cost function, here is the state transition function, why don't you implement this uh, maximum minimum principle based algorithm and try and optimize the functioning of the overall system. And typically you would want to optimize emissions you want to minimize say CO2 emissions or CO emissions or NOx emissions. Uh, so those that's one of the, uh, you know, depending on the regulations, of course, many countries around the world are changing regulations all the time about emissions coming out of vehicles or trucks or, uh, or, or other industries. And you would apply these algorithms to uh, optimize those things. You can do this, you can optimize energy consumption, you can optimize resource consumption, you can optimize emissions, uh, you can optimize noise and vibration coming out of large machinery. So those are all the places where you can apply this algorithm to uh, optimize performance. Okay. So if there are no more questions, I'll jump to the next topic, which is dynamic programming. Okay. So the setup in dynamic programming is exactly the same as it was in the maximum princi uh, minimum principle case. I have the state transition function. I have the cost function J, but now this is a function of gamma naught to gamma T minus one. So UT equals to gamma T XT. This is the closed loop policy.
and the cost function is the same. Okay, exactly the same uh, state equation, exactly the same cost function. The only difference from the earlier situation is now I have a sensor which explicitly monitors the state. So the whole purpose of having this sensor is to monitor the state of the system and provide that feedback to a computational, say a microprocessor or an FPGA or some large computer. It will feed in all the sensor information um, uh, which uh, which basically gives you information about the current state. And then you will have a control policy which takes the state as input and outputs the control action that needs to be taken. Okay, and then that control action will then be applied to the point, to the plant. Uh, one of the first uh, papers written on closed loop policy is written by actually James Clark Maxwell I'm sure you would have studied it in your uh, in your 3551 or feedback controls class. This was in 1856-ish. I, I, I'm not sure of the remember. I don't remember the, the exact year, but it's around 1850s. And the title of the paper is On Governors. Okay. And the governors are essentially used, were used or, or the, uh, James Watt actually, so you, so you probably have heard of James Watt, I'm sure. So James Watt developed governors, which looked at the pressure in the steam engine. So, so it, will, it will monitor the pressure in the steam engine. And based on that, it will change the amount of, uh, I think heat that is entering the engine and that would that would close the feedback loop. So before that, the engines were usually monitored by humans and they would figure out how much coal to put in and how much coal to not put in. Uh, but after James Watt discovered the uh, invented governors, the governor would automatically look at how much the steam pressure is and figure out how much heat to inject and how much heat to reject. And it basically revolutionized the field of steam engines. And of course, that led to all the industrial revolution. I mean, industrial revolution was already underway, but uh, it was a big leap within the industrial revolution. And, uh, and, and rest is, as we know, history. So this was actually in 1700s, late 1700s. It's very fascinating, okay? So just the simple idea of going from open loop control to a closed loop control essentially changed the history of technology. And, uh, and this is happening across all the sectors right now. So if you look at stock markets, people want to use data from, like a lot of new FinTech companies have come up that are essentially coming up with closed loop policies to determine how you should invest, how much money should be invested in what stocks to, optimize the overall return on the on the portfolio so so this is just just used across a wide range of spectrum um, and and I can't uh, do justice uh, in this class just talking about individual areas uh, in technology where because of proliferation of sensors you can actually get an accurate uh, estimate of the current state and then you can use some sort of optimization, dynamic programming tool or, or some other way to come up with this closed loop policy map gamma T that can give you the action and you can optimize the overall performance of the system. So it could be FinTech, it could be um, uh, other engineering systems, chemical plants, oil and natural gas plants and so on. Okay, so this is the problem. So the goal is, uh, so they weren't in, interested in optimization. They were just interested in understanding how, what are the underlying principles for closed loop control. 
Uh, of course, you study in ECE 3551, some of those principles uh, that were developed starting 1856 all the way to 1940s. And now in this particular class, we are learning how to optimize. So we are not just under, interested in understanding the stability of the system. We actually are interested in knowing how to optimize the performance uh, of the system. Okay, so let me take you back to the year 1949 to 1952. And what was discovered at that time was Bellman's principle of optimality. Okay, so the entire theory of dynamic pro programming is based on uh, what is called Bellman's principle of optimality, which says that gamma zero star to gamma T minus one star is optimal policy if and only if, okay? So this is an if and only if statement, gamma T star to gamma t minus one star is optimal policy for summation CS This, ha this has to hold for every T. Okay, so what does Bellman's principle of optimality say? Well, it says the following thing. If you have an optimal strategy and you truncate that optimal strategy, so this is the truncated optimal strategy starting from gamma T star all the way to gamma T minus one star. So the truncated optimal strategy has to be an optimal policy for the truncated cost. Okay. But you are not doing the truncate truncation starting from time zero to time T. You're doing the truncation from time T to time capital T minus one. Okay, so the tail, the tail of the policy has to be optimal with respect to the tail of the cost. And that's the biggest insight Bellman had back in 1949 to 1952. And a similar result was also established by Isaac. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the first name. Isaac is I think the last name. So, so he also observed the same principle of optimality around 1949 in a, in a confidential report uh, so that's why it was not known that Isaac actually came up with the principle of optimality, but then Bellman discovered it, the principle of optimality independent of Isaac. And uh, that's why the name bears his name, Bellman's principle of optimality, but it was around the same time. Okay. 
So what does this, uh, how does this help us in coming up with an algorithm for computing the optimal policy? Okay, so remember that what this, pol what this Spellman's principle of optimality says that this truncated policy is optimal for the truncated cost. So let me break it down. So, so I have gamma star T minus one is optimal for CT minus one. Let me not write the arguments. So, so gamma star T minus one is optimal for CT minus one CT. Then gamma star T minus two, gamma star T minus one is optimal for and so on. Okay, so this is how you uh, uh, discover that now there is an algorithm. So first I have to do is compute gamma star T minus one by minimizing the cost, the cost CT minus one plus CT then gamma star t minus one is known. So I can then compute gamma star t minus one by minimizing this cost and fixing gamma star t minus one that I've obtained from this particular step. And then I can keep going backwards and compute the optimal policy. So that's how you translate this Bellman's principle of optimality to a recursive algorithm, which computes the optimal policy of the current time step assuming that I know what the future optimal policy is going to be. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for questions. Anything that's not clear in what we have discussed so far? Yeah, hi, Professor, so is the... Yeah. Uh, Optimal policy depends on the initial state at zero. Well, so in this case, the policy depends on the state at every, so, the, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. So does gamma T depends on X naught? Uh, it turns out yeah. that it doesn't, no, it doesn't. Gamma T will not depend on X naught. In fact, U zero will be a function of X zero. Okay, so gamma star T will not depend on X naught. Does not depend on X zero. Okay, we'll see in a little bit, you know, when we start deriving the expressions, we'll see that it doesn't depend on X naught. Good question. Any other question? Okay, so now this algorithm, this recursive algorithm is known as the dynamic programming algorithm, DP algorithm. It has different name uh, in different uh, say books or papers. So someone will call it backward induction algorithm. Someone will call it dynamic programming algorithm. Some people call it uh, Dijkstra. So if, you, if you're using it on a graph, then it's called Dijkstra algorithm in computer science. So all of these algorithms are essentially stemming from this Bellman's principle of optimality. Okay. So let's talk about dynamic programming. Algorithm. So the first thing that I need to do is I need to compute gamma star t minus one, which minimizes ct minus one plus ct. Okay. So I have to solve the following two equations.
I'm going to let gamma star t minus one at x t minus one to be the argument of u t minus one Okay, so CT depends on XT, but we know that XT can be written as FT minus one, XT minus one, UT minus one. Right, so then I have the current cost, I have the future cost, but I know that the future cost depends on the current state and the current action uh, under the influence of the state transition function Ft minus one. So I can write it as argmin ut minus one, ct minus one plus ct composition Ft minus one evaluated at the current state action pair. And I'm going to store the argument in the gamma star t minus one. And I'm going to define another variable for another function vt minus one, which will be called the value function. And this is the minimum over ut minus one of the same thing. Okay, so I have to minimize the cost at time t minus one and the cost at time t because of the Bellman's principle for, of optimality. So I need to compute this gamma star t minus one. So I'm going to set gamma star t minus one as the argument over all possible actions of the current cost and the future cost, but I can write the future cost in terms of the current state and the current action. Okay, so that is this CT composition FT minus one. Now the CT minus one plus this, this term CT composition FT minus one, this is actually a function of the current state and the current action. And I need to compute the argument. I can apply any of the known algorithms like gradient descent or, or Newton's method or uh, augmented Lagrangian methods and so on in order to compute this argument. Okay. Now, of course, there are two things when you solve an optimization problem, you get the optimal solution and you get the optimal value, right? So the optimal solution is stored in gamma star T minus one. Optimal value is stored in the value function. This is the value function at time t minus one. Okay, so now I have solved the problem at time capital T minus one. So let's move on to the next step where I need to solve for time t minus two. Okay, any questions so far on this uh, computation of the value at time t minus one? No, okay. So let's move on to the second step. Gamma star T minus one, gamma star T minus one minimizes CT minus two plus CT minus one plus CT. Okay, but I already know this. So this part, this is something the 
gamma star t minus one, I have already computed in part one. Okay, so I don't need to recompute it because uh, it's it's already been computed. So the only thing that needs to be computed is gamma star t minus two. So let's see, I'm going to set gamma star t minus two of x t minus two as the argument of u t minus two Okay, I'm going to write a pretty long equation. So let me write it below. Okay, so I have substituted u t minus one with gamma star t minus one everywhere. Okay, now what is the now, what is the uh, value of this term? So think about what is this CT minus one at gamma star T minus one and CT composition FT minus one at gamma star T minus one is. What is this whole, whole term equal to? value function evaluated at uh, t minus one. Right, right. So this whole term is actually equal to, if you go above, you see that the minimum at ut minus one is stored in the value function at xt minus one. And that's exactly this expression that you see in this red block. So this is actually vt minus one at xt minus one. So in fact, what I can replace it with is argument of ut minus two So I've already computed this future value. So I can just substitute that future value right here. But now there is still a problem. The problem is I recognize that this two sum is actually equal to the value, but the value depends on xt minus one. And then I remember that, oh, actually I can write xt minus one equals to I can use the state transition function to write xt minus one as a function of xt minus two and ut minus two. Okay. Okay, everything's clear so far. Let's proceed. This is argument ut minus two
I can write it as the minimum of the current cost plus future value composition, the current state transition function. Okay, and I do the argument over ut minus two, and what I get is gamma star. Gamma star x t minus one. Uh, gamma the current gamma star is actually equal to the argument of the current cost plus future value. So the argument is again stored in the policy gamma star, and the value function stores the minimum of this whole thing. Now you can continue this process again and again, right? And what you get is the dynamic programming recursion. So any questions so far before I jump onto the overall DP recursion? Any burning issue? Anything that's giving you a heartache? No? So all the steps are clear so far? So we computed gamma star t minus one by truncating the cost function and minimizing over all u t minus one, stored the value function, then computed gamma star t minus two. After going through a series of steps, we realized that the gamma star t minus two is actually argument of ct minus two plus the future value function composes composition with the current state transition function. And then I again stored the value function and now what I'm seeing is a, is a pattern that is emerging out of it, which is I define my terminal So we get a pattern. And the pattern is I define my terminal value function to be the terminal cost. And then I define the recursion gamma star t of x t is argument of ut This is the famous dynamic programming algorithm. Okay, and you can prove that that satisfies the Bellman principle of optimality. which implies
Okay, so this is the way to compute the optimal closed loop policy in a dynamic system. What we have studied in today's class is we talked about Bellman's principle of optimality. We didn't prove it, uh, but a proof is available in multiple books, which you can refer to. Uh, I may I may just post some notes where Bellman principle of optimality is actually proved. So that way you can look at the proof yourself if you have free time. Uh, but what we need, needed to know was, so once you agree with Bellman's principle of optimality, all you have to do is come up with an algorithm so that you can come up with, you, you can compute the optimal policy uh, exploiting that structure of the Bellman's principle of optimality. So Bellman did exactly that and came up with this dynamic programming algorithm where you started with optimizing the terminal time. Uh, so optimizing at time t minus one, computing the optimal policy and optimal value, and then substituting that in the optimization problem for time t minus two. And then you continue this backward induction process. In this problem, of course, you see that there is this argument here so one of the questions that you may naturally ask is how do you compute this argument for every state? So remember, this is like the state is xt and for every possible state xt, you need to compute this argument over all ut. And that's the, I, I think someone was alluding to the fact that the finding a closed loop policy may be extremely difficult or complicated. And this is exactly what's complicated about it because if you have like a million states and you have 500 actions for every million state, you have to perform this minimization over a set which, is, which has 500 elements. And that makes the computation of dynamic programming extremely hard because there is an exponential growth with the number of states and number of actions, the computational complexity of the overall execution of the dynamic programming algorithm becomes exceedingly large. And that's why dynamic programming algorithm was not commonplace earlier because uh, we didn't have the computational machinery to execute such large number of computations. However, what has changed in the past 15 years is the computers have become more and more sophisticated. And moreover, there is this whole new field called uh, uh, reinforcement learning or uh, machine learning, which has allowed us to, sim to simplify this overall computation. Okay. And, and that's where you see a lot of new opportunities coming up because we have the computation available to do this argument for every possible state, or at least uh, come up with an approximation of argument for most of the states that will be visited during the decision process. And machine learning and reinforcement learning is increasingly being used to get that approximation. And if not compute, like you, you can't compute the optimal policy, but you can compute near optimal policy or approximately optimal policies. And that's where a lot of innovation is happening across different fields. And so if you pick up a newspaper uh, or, or a magazine or, or, or any other tech news source, you will see people talking about AI and machine learning and so on, all of them are essentially trying to run this algorithm for very complicated systems with a lot of data and with very sophisticated computing machinery. And that's where, you know, a lot of jobs are getting created and, and a lot of people are looking for hiring talent in this particular field. So, um, so that's all I have for dynamic programming. Uh, I'll, I'll take any questions you may have on this stuff. We have like four minutes more in the class. So please feel free to ask me any questions you may have on this topic. Sorry, I had a question earlier, but I had a problem with the, the microphone. Okay, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question in dynamic programming algorithm step number one. 
Okay. When we find gamma over t minus one, uh, is this the one like that we're supposed to have like given to us or, so, or like? No, you are given this ct minus one plus ct, right? So uh, you know what the cost function is. Okay. You know what the state transition function is. So you are given this ft minus one. Okay, great. And then for every xt minus one, you have to compute this argument of this sum of two functions. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes, sir. Yeah, so this, this part is known and then argument needs to be computed using Newton's method or gradient descent method. Yeah, yeah, whatever method we have taken right. in previous. Correct, yeah. correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, thank you. I just was confused, you know, a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, okay. So hopefully that clarifies everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah that okay. clarifies it. Thank you. Okay, okay, cool. Professor? Yes. Uh, so, so, so the this algorithm you introduced today is like before, uh, before we run the algorithm, we we first uh, need to calculate all this uh, gamma star and the v for yeah. for all the uh for all all the choice of x t right and then after we got that uh, uh and then we um. And then when we are operating the system, we observe an xt and like directly Correct. find the uh, find the gamma t. That's right. I see. I see. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. Right. So ut would be gamma star t at xt. So when you are operating the machinery, you just plug in the sensor data at xt, so sensor data from time t, which is xt, you plug it into the optimal policy and you get the action, and this action gets executed on the system. Any other question? Perfect. The office hours is going to start in uh, 10, 15 minutes. So if you have any questions on the assignment, please feel free to drop by in the office hours. Uh, see you guys on Monday. Uh, note that the assignment is due next week on Wednesday, and then there is a midterm two on Friday of next week. Midterm two has exactly the same format as midterm one, except that the questions are going to be slightly more difficult. Um, okay. Um, Talk to you guys on Monday then.